facing death threats, one of the former Tacoma, Washington police officers cleared of wrongdoing in the death of a black man resigns from his new job. Good evening and welcome to West Coast Wrap. I'm Joey Horta. Christopher Burbank is now leaving his post with the Thurston County Sheriff's Department the day after being sworn in. He became known as the 2020 death of Manuel Ellis. Known for that, Burbank and two other officers were charged in connection with Ellis's death. They were cleared of any wrongdoing and left the Tacoma Police Department. It's a case that's drawn comparisons to the killing of George Floyd. On Tuesday, Bur Burbank was sworn in as a lateral patrol deputy in Thurston County, Washington. Today, Sheriff, Dep Sheriff Derek Sanders rather announced his resignation. He says death threats to Burbank's family and the community response to his hiring are the reasons why he's leaving. The attorney representing the Ellis family says he was stunned to learn about Burbank's new role in law enforcement. We remain deeply concerned that any jurisdiction would actually give this man a gun, a badge, and the opportunity to commit um, what could be horrific acts against another citizen. The Ellis family filed a wrongful death lawsuit against Burbank and the other officers. It's still pending in federal court. And this afternoon, Sheriff Derek Sanders issued a statement on Burbank's swift departure from his department, saying, quote, I entirely misjudged community perception on the investigation and jury process that Deputy Burbank completed. I recognize the harm this has caused to marginalized communities, and I was wrong. And we're just beginning to learn how people on the West Coast have been impacted by Taiwan's 7.4 magnitude earthquake. So far, at least nine people have died in Taiwan and more than a thousand are hurt. Search and rescue crews are scrambling to find victims who may have been who may be trapped, that is, in damaged buildings. Fox 11's Susan Harrisuna spoke with people in a Southern California Taiwanese community who are desperate to get answers from loved ones and want to get help out there. Michie Chen sings away her concerns after a 7.4 quake rocked her home in Taipei and broke a treasured memento. Former President Li Tenghui uh, gave her a gift, uh, was a teapot, and also fell and, and broke. So she's really sad about that. Ken Wu of the Taiwan Center translates for Chen. His parents, too, live in Taipei, and he was surprised when he could reach them so easily. Normally, when the earthquake as big as this one happens, uh, first thing you will experience power outage and telecommunication breakdown. And we're not getting any of those. We're getting a lot of information from Taiwan, especially from our family, friends, and uh, for our communities, uh, community members. Wow, that's, that's At the Taipei Bistro in Alhambra, Ming Shu regularly watches the news. Their family in Taipei is fine, but the images of buildings askew and crumpled in the epicenter of Walen made them feel very lucky. We've been to that city. That is a very tiny, small city. The family had just traveled there in January. Yes, we are so, so lucky. Really, really honest, honest. Even though, I mean, the Taiwanese get used to the earthquake, but not for the 7.2. Back at the Taiwan Center, Wu and others are waiting to hear how locals here can help. The center is fielding calls from people wondering if there's a relief effort. So far, the community is just standing by, unlike the response 25 years ago after the 1999 7.6 quake. There were a lot more, you know, uh, needs for, uh, like, blankets or, or money or food that time. But right now, people are kind of, like, well-prepared. Fox 11 Susan Hiroshuna reporting. And to hear how the earthquake may have affected flights to the Bay Area, we checked in with travelers at SFO. We caught a group of people who just touched down after leaving Taiwan. They explained how the earthquake affected their airport experience on the island. And it lasted pretty long. It was longer than I expected. Yeah. People definitely were trying to say earthquake, earthquake. Um, you could see some of the ticket agents like get underneath the counter already. The uh, clerk was just about ready to issue me my, uh, my boarding pass, and the place started to shake and shake. It took about 15 seconds, but somehow it seemed a lot longer. And I looked up. It's a vast building, very large chandeliers, and they were swinging. And I looked around, and most of the people were running out. Other travelers told us they were able to drive safely to the airport since the highways were still accessible. 
UCLA professor John Wallace teaches structural engineering and he was in Taiwan during the 1999 earthquake. He tells us a lot of the damage this time around was in older buildings. You see buildings with uh, retail at the base level or commercial that are, have open uh, floor plans at the front. They collapse at the first level. Uh, if corner buildings, corner buildings might be open on two sides and they have a, a problem of some twisting or some torsion that leads to partial collapse. And you're basically seeing that most of the photos I've seen have been buildings where the first story has collapsed. He also says lessons learned from other earthquakes around the world are influencing California building codes. Seven members of a teen gang based in the suburbs of Phoenix are now facing charges in the murder of a 16 year old. Fox's William Lejunas breaks down the case now from Los Angeles. We would enter a not guilty plea. Police call them the Gilbert Goons, named after the wealthy Phoenix suburb of Gilbert, Arizona. Last month, one teen after another appeared in court, accused of killing 16-year-old Preston Lorb, who prosecutors say died of brain injuries after the gang attacked him at a party. Two of the seven are under 18, but all are charged as adults. There has got to be at least 250 kids here. They're walking the streets. These kids are going to hit each other. Someone's going to get hurt. Police say the gang targeted victims at fast food outlets, parking lots, and parties, leaving them with skull fractures, broken bones, and missing teeth. The goons allegedly attacked Lord after he accused them of stealing a friend's $10 gold chain. He died later in a hospital. The manner in which his life ended is heartbreaking to us. Talon ran her through the first punch, police say, messaging on Snapchat, I accidentally killed a kid. I guess I'm just too strong. And according to the police report, another member, Talon Vigil, messaged, I hit a kid and he fell. The kid died. Let me be very clear. This investigation and review are not over. Prosecutors also say Renner's parents sent their son out of town to hide his injuries. Another couple wanted in on $10,000 in reward money by turning in some members while protecting their own son. We are looking at all aspects of this investigation to see if there are any charges that we could bring against people that have either uh, tampered with witnesses or obstruction. The Gilbert goons go on trial later this year. The evidence against them includes a 1,200-page police report, numerous witness accounts, some 600 videos, and in some cases, incriminating digital admissions from the suspects themselves. In Los Angeles, William Lajeunesse, Fox News. Reproductive rights activists say that they've collected enough signatures to allow voters to decide whether abortion rights should be protected in Arizona's Constitution. Arizona for Abortion Access needed to gather 384,000 signatures by July. The group says it already has more than 500,000, but they still need to be verified. If that happens, a ballot measure would allow abortions at about 24 weeks. As supporters say this will protect the rights of women to make their own medical decisions. Opponents fear the measure is too broad believe firmly that, you know, pregnant people should have the freedom to make decisions about abortion with their families and their medical providers, not politicians. This amendment means giving up those critical safety precautions and that required medical doctor just to expand abortion beyond the current 15 weeks and beyond what most voters support. Under the current Arizona law, abortions are legal up to 15 weeks of pregnancy. There's an exception when it comes to saving a mother's life. Well, some college basketball fans are turning Glendale, Arizona into a spring break destination. This is a live look at State Farm Stadium in Glendale, which will host the men's NCAA Final Four. The first game not until Saturday, but fans and teams are already arriving. The Purdue, Boy <laughs> all the teams are already showing up. The Purdue Boilmakers and the Alabama Crimson Tide are in Phoenix now. As Fox 10's Danielle Miller reports, workers at Sky Harbor International Airport think they'll be nearly as busy as they were during the Super Bowl. Phoenix Sky Harbor officials are telling us that we may see crowds similar to what we saw during the Super Bowl. They're telling us that they are well prepared. The Tuesday after the game will be our busiest day, but the Sunday um, after the first round game will also be busy. I was like, I'm booking the flights. 
got my tickets and I'm ready to go. The minutes are ticking down as we get closer to crowning the college hoop champs. Many fans like Purdue fan Brandon Galambos are making their way to the Valley before the big game to get in on all the action. I feel like Purdue's going to pull off a win. I've been going to all the games and I specifically flew out here to see the Boilermakers get a win. The airport is ready to welcome fans. The final four countdown clock is up and the recycling bins have been transformed into basketball hoops. Thursday, they'll increase their volunteer numbers at the airport to keep up with the increase. And the final four is also bringing in volunteers who will be um, in the airport to answer questions about all the festivities um, as well as provide information. Brandon is happy to have traveled to the Valley. He's hoping his team will slam dunk the competition. I feel like we're going to get this win against NC State. I'm a little concerned about Burns. He's been playing good, uh, but I feel like we're going to see the UConn in the national championship and the Boilermakers getting a win. Delta has added four additional arrivals and departures to and from North Carolina and two to and from Alabama. Danielle Miller, Fox 10 News. Passengers on a bus in Seattle pulled out their cameras when a police officer pulled over their driver. The heated exchange that follows now under investigation. Coming up, why some people think the officer was on a power trip. Plus, we'll break down why something that happened more than a year ago is being blamed for this week's streaks of fire in the sky. And in weather, here's our live camera looking out towards Seattle. Partly cloudy skies, a current temperature of 50 degrees. I am tracking a cold storm that will bring some snow for parts of the West Coast. Other areas, temperatures warming back up into the 80s. We'll have uh, the update coming up. Excuse me. Excuse me. No, call them. I was in motion. Okay, I understand that. Video of a heated exchange between a Seattle police officer and the bus driver he pulled over is getting a lot of attention on social media. Some people call the police officer's behavior an abuse of power. Fox 13's Lauren Donovan reports now passengers pulled out their cameras to record a lot of what happened. Where am I helping? Uh, there's an officer that claims he's pulling me over uh, because he cut me off. And he was in an unmarked police car. Listen in as a frustrated Metro bus driver makes the call into dispatch. I honked the horn at him because I almost hit him. And now he pulled me over. Cell phone footage from a rider sheds light on what the operator couldn't see. Excuse me. Excuse me. A heated exchange between driver and officer. You just ran from us. What are you talking about? I ran from Our lights and sirens are on. I pulled over. This video captioned Seattle's finest is now making the rounds on social media, garnering hundreds of comments. People criticize the officer for going on a power trip. Let him know to get another bus down here, another driver down here. You're not, you're not driving. People take you to jail. Maybe right now you're obstructing because I'm stopping you. Silent riders delayed by the disturbance witness it all. People online want to know what was the point of pulling the bus over. He says he's stopped by a police officer. He wants a supervisor because he might be getting arrested. Abuse of power complaints have spiraled into an investigation from Seattle's Office of Police Accountability. The most heightening point was when the officer started to use and switch bait his words to make it seem as though the bus driver had committed a crime. I'm stopping you. For what? What reason? What, what is the For the road rage. There was no road rage. After watching it over, Nikia Hunter with Washington's Coalition for Police Accountability sure had a lot to say. Just combative at best, not a way that you go in to de-escalate a situation or even understand what happened. Nikia points out priorities are clearly out of whack. SPD says right now they lack the manpower needed to investigate misdemeanor crimes and sexual assaults. I never said I was arrested for obstruction. <laughs> You can hear the mockery because they themselves are, like I was, at a great pause in what did the bus driver do wrong that would make you jump on here and start acting like you are apprehending a true criminal. Fox 13's Lauren Donovan reporting, and she did reach out to the Police Officers Guild and Seattle Police for comment they have not responded. Well, we know now 
Tonight, that what caused those streaks of fire in the sky over Southern California, U.S. Space Command confirming today the fireballs were space debris. They formed on Tuesday as pieces of a Chinese module used to launch three astronauts in 2022 to re-enter the atmosphere. The heat shield burned away, creating the illusion of a meteor shower. There are no reports of anyone being hurt by the debris. Members of the international aerospace community have created guidelines to try to prevent this from happening again. Snow lovers can count on Arizona's Snow Bowl Ski Resort to stay open through the end of this month. Resort workers and flag staff are now welcoming spring storms, dumping snow in the region this week. They say it's possible their season could run beyond April, depending on the future storms. So let's bring in KTVU meteorologist Mark DeMaio, who's tracking a system that's expected to dump more snow on that region later this week, Mark. Hi there, Joey. Yeah, it looks like uh, the active weather pattern, it will continue as we head into early April. We're still talking about a cold system that will definitely have an influence on West Coast weather. Right now, the radar coverage, as you can see, some uh, coverage up in portions of the Pacific Northwest and also in the Sierra as well. And we'll be talking about a winter weather advisory closer to the Lake Tahoe area. In Seattle, some cloud cover earlier today. Temperature in the lower 50s, 53 degrees as we head toward San Francisco. It has been a mild stretch over the past few days in the San Francisco Bay Area. We are expecting cooler temperatures for tomorrow, and then the rainfall definitely making a comeback tomorrow as well. And then out in the Phoenix area, lots of clear skies, a warm 83 degrees. They're going to hold on to the 80s for tomorrow, then another cool down wants to settle in, really settle in later in the week as we approach the weekend. So here is the satellite. You know, April, to, April could be an interesting time of month. One day could be sunny, warm, temperatures in the 80s. Other day, we could be talking the next day, we could be, talk, could be talking about uh, some cold showers and maybe some low snow levels. And that's what we have right now. So we have this frontal band moving into northern California and that cold speckled cloud cover. It's really showing up on the satellite this evening, so this will definitely move into a Northern California, and this could bring some shower chances even down in Southern California as well. So about a 30 to 40 percent chance of a shower up in Seattle for tomorrow. Temperatures only in the 40s. Rain returns for San Francisco, about a 40 percent chance of showers in uh, Los Angeles for tomorrow, and then out in the Phoenix area. In fact, you can see the upper level wind pattern. See kind of a, a ridge here. That ridge is bringing sunshine and some warm temperatures. 70s out toward Denver for tomorrow. And then we're talking about another day of some 80s out in the Phoenix area for your Thursday. In the Sierra, this is a winter weather advisory, another snow producer. And with that cold air settling in, snow levels coming down eventually to around 2,000 to 2,500 feet. So the winter weather advisory until 10 p.m. on Friday in the Lake Tahoe area. And snowfall could be around 10 to 20 inches. So we continue to add to that snowpack. Here is the forecast model. It's fair, fairly active for tomorrow for your Thursday. Up in your region out towards San Francisco, Monterey Bay, and of course the snow out toward Lake Tahoe. Here's that shower chance in Southern California for tomorrow. And then as we take this in your Friday, it is still unsettled. It's still cool and it is still a breezy as we head toward Friday as this forecast model kind of showing you the rainfall and the snowfall kind of expanding over portions of the West Coast. So here is the plan tomorrow. Seattle, lots of cloud cover. There's that shower chance. San Francisco, rain and some thunderstorms. Shower chance for Los Angeles for Thursday and into Friday. Look at Phoenix, 89 for Thursday. Day. A sharp drop off in those numbers by Friday to Saturday. Looks like temperatures in the Denver area still warm, as you can see, approaching the mid-70s for Thursday. So you can kind of pick uh, pick what your forecast for tomorrow. Temperatures either in the 80s, or we're talking about uh, some cold snow showers and maybe some thunderstorms. A bit of some everything, a bit of everything in the forecast for tomorrow. Something for everybody. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. Yeah. Well, the day after the famed Tropicana Casino shut down in Las Vegas, a piece of the property gets new life tonight. The resort sign will light up as part of a new exhibit at the Neon Museum. Fox 5's Mike Allen shows us how visitors to the museum are becoming part of the old casino's legacy. Yeah, so less than two months ago, the Neon Museum introduced a new way for people to document their personal history here in Las Vegas. It's called Rachel. It stands for Record and Collect Historical Experiences in Las Vegas. It gives you prompts like, What's your favorite memory in Las Vegas? And then you speak it into the microphone in the booth. Lately, the prompts have been specific to the Tropicana, asking people what the hotel means to them. Some of their responses are then shared to social media by the museum. And the executive director tells me this enriches the experience of the museum. A booth that allows visitors, locals, transplants, international visitors to come through and have a moment to come and tell their story. It is a great opportunity to really capture 
um, a cross-section of people. The executive director, Aaron Berger, tells me the museum gets about 200,000 visitors each year, and it hopes to use some of their responses, not just on social media, but also incorporate them into the tours that people take here to give more of a personal experience when people are looking at those signs over there behind me. Reporting tonight at the Neon Museum, Mike Allen, Fox 5 News, local Las Vegas. It's impossible for most people to escape the bite of inflation these days. Coming up, strategies shoppers are using to cope with price hikes at the grocery store. And we'll get you ready for a Powerball drawing that could turn someone into a billionaire. Welcome back. Shoppers still feeling the pinch at grocery stores. Fox's Kennedy Hayes spoke with a market owner and an economist in Colorado about how shoppers can put together a strategy to get the most bang for their buck. The owner of this community grocery store tells me budgeting can be tough right now, not only for her customers, but for her too. I don't even pay myself a minimum wage yet, so I understand like pockets being tight. Sun Market owner Andrea Leo says she tries to keep prices low. Sometimes I pay more for potatoes than I'm charging. Uh, same with milk. I make like 10 cents on milk, but it's more important for me to have it affordable so that people can come in. Inflation is hovering between 2 and 3 percent nationally, but economists say some food prices remain inflated by up to 10 percent. And even if you don't notice a price hike, you should watch out for shrinking products. We should look at the package, make sure that uh, uh, how your uh, product size has not gone down and uh, you are paying uh, the right price for the right product. Customers say they try to find the best deals by shopping at multiple stores. The salary I'm getting paid is not going to cut it for much longer. So uh, definitely just want things to slow down a little bit. Really being careful about where we spend our money. It's um, coming down to the necessities and trying to eat healthy is even harder. That market owner says inflation had the biggest impact on prices of her poultry and produce. To help, she donates some for free to families in need. I want to have something for everyone, no matter what the budget. According to financial services company Moody Analytics, Americans are paying on average $1,000 more each month than they were this time two years ago. Economists say prices may not go back to where they used to be, but may stabilize by the end of the year. In Denver, Kennedy Hayes, Fox News. Well, tonight's Powerball jackpot is the fourth largest in history. It's estimated to be worth $1.09 billion, with a B. Still no winning ticket for the top prize in Monday's drawing, but six players did win a million bucks. None of those were sold here in the West, but you can buy Powerball tickets in all West Coast states except for Utah, Nevada, Alaska, and Hawaii. Thanks for joining us here tonight. You can always stay up to date on all the stories we're covering online. Just go to westcoastwrap.com and stream all of our shows on your smart TV by downloading the Fox Local app. Good night. Thanks for watching.